What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. Today with me, I have guest Dr. Stephen Deeks, who is a medical doctor and an HIV researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to so, be here. Thank, yeah, man. Thanks for agreeing to doing this. Um, I think I will always like to start my interviews off like, because I'm very curious how you ended up in the worlds of HIV research. So if you can kind of give us a quick background on like how you got into this field of research, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. So I, so I did my training in, to become a medical doctor in San Francisco between 1990 and 1993. And that, that was about as bad as it ever got. In terms of yeah. HIV, half of the hospital, um, half, 50% of people in our hospital during those years had HIV. So it was something you could not avoid. Um, and to be honest, I didn't enjoy the work in the hospital because people were sick and dying. I tried to do my best, but I also had a clinic in which I was taking care of these very young, healthy, highly engaged gay men who had this disease, but who were fighting the system and, um, and, I, and I found that I, they were my age and they were, I, I just bonded with them. And I, I, I chose to have a career in the outpatient setting. Make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. You mean, you're definitely looking at someone that's your age, you kind of see yourself right in them and it, 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 it pulled at your heartstrings and, and that's how you ended up getting in that, you know, line of research. Yeah, yeah, no. So th- this is the early '90s, right? This is before we had treatment. So, and and people, if they get HIV, they're usually pretty healthy for several years. So I I had this group of basically my peers, um, who are who who had organized in San Francisco and elsewhere into these activist groups, these community groups, and they were fighting the fight. Um, by this point in time, they actually had uh, started collaborating with Tony Fauci, now famous for COVID. But at yeah. the time, he was very famous because he was the first person, really, I think, in science to reach out to community people. So you had Tony Fauci at NIH, you had these community advocates, um, and um, we had a very powerful Department of Public Health. And it was a magical time because we all came together, and I, I almost became an, an AIDS activist myself. And we, we, we formed these collaborations and, and we did great things because um, it was from that point forward that we began to develop these treatments that basically has turned this into a very manageable disease. Yeah. And, and so one of the things I kind of wanted to ask, right, is like this is a, an interesting period of history. So because this disease was in primarily the predominantly gay community and I think a lot of minority communities, like how hard was it to begin to get funding and to get the public to care about that in the early days? Like, was it an uphill battle or because I just I, I wasn't really I was alive, but, you know, I, I was a baby at this time. So. What do you remember about that? Well, the, so there was different waves. The first wave was, was, was essentially in the United States. The first wave was all gay men, but, and it was everybody, right? Because it, it was, no one knew about HIV. So in my clinic, I had CEOs of major companies. I had like a, a guy from Apple, a major player at Apple. And then, you know, and I had the entire spectrum because it affected everybody. But very quickly, those people who had resources and healthcare, they were no longer getting HIV. So by the end, so by the mid in 1990s, the epidemic shifted toward, you know, the, the communities that were not as, in, as engaged to healthcare and primarily people of color, primarily women. Um, um, and so the entire epidemic changed from the early 90s to the late 90s. We're sort of seeing this with COVID now, the same kind of situation. People with means know how to protect themselves. People who are a bit marginalized do not. So it was quite a dynamic period during that at that time. Wow, wow, and and so I think a, a good place right to kind of dig into is there's there's HIV and then there's AIDS and and f- for the listeners that might be a little bit ignorant to to this, could could you kind of explain the the difference between these two 
uh, stages of the disease. Like I might may, maybe may gotten that wrong. Sure. No, HIV is the virus. Yep. And AIDS is the disease that you have when you're sick. And um, go ahead. Yeah. Again, it's just this COVID analogies. It's like SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. Yep. But what you have is COVID, right? So it's so we don't we don't talk about AIDS very much anymore because most people with HIV we put them on treatment before they get AIDS. AIDS is the kind of thing that happens when you're dying. We don't see AIDS very much anymore because treatment prevents it. Okay. Okay. That makes that makes sense. And now I read somewhere that like there is a drug that you can take before intercourse that would prevent you from getting uh, HIV? Is that, is there any truth to that? Or is I remember oh, yeah. reading bullshit? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's called PrEP. PrEP. Um, okay. Pre-exposure prophylaxis. PrEP. Um, and it's been studied mainly in gay men um, where it's been incredibly effective. And if you take one pill once a day, your risk of getting HIV is close to zero. Okay. Wow. Um, and now we've shifted toward uh, giving these infusions, injections, injections in the muscle shots that you can get by now, like once a month, once every two months. Um, so just one injection in two months, you're basically free to do what you want to do without getting um, about being too worried about having HIV. The caveats are important. It's been mainly proven in gay men. Um, it's been more difficult. The other major risk group are, are young women. And that population has been more difficult to study. It's been harder to find drugs uh, that work in that population. We've looked at vaginal rings and so forth. But these injectables, these 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 one shot in the arm, they're going to work for everybody. They're easy to take. They're affordable. They're going to be basically um, standard of care in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and throughout the world, including sub-Saharan Africa. Truly game-changing stuff. Holy smokes. So, <laughs> it, but it gets better. It gets oh, better. Can I just that, let me finish? Please do it. Please do. So, the news gets better. So, the big, the big thing that happened in HIV is that we learned several years ago that if you do have HIV and you take the current medications, okay, you're on treatment, it's almost impossible to infect other people. So think about that. That means now that people who have HIV, they no longer have to worry about infecting others. They, there's less stigma. They, they're not like this public health pariah that you have to worry about. It's, it's freed up. I mean, so people who do have HIV, you don't want to get HIV, so you want to take the PrEP. But if you have HIV, you take the medications and... You, you pose no risk to anyone. It's an amazing effect on how people feel about themselves and so forth. Wow. Yes. Oh, I, I actually, I mean, technically, right. I did. I, I, I think that makes sense. Cause I always think of like magic Johnson, right? Like he, he got it in the early nineties when it was a death sentence, but he had a lot of resources right. and means and ended up having children, didn't transmit it to his children, or his partner. How long yep. has, how long have we had like on a, I guess a wide scale, um, the basis, like how, how long have we had this ability to do this since like the late nineties, early two thousands, or is this something that's well, just, we, we, yeah, um, we sort of, the, the, so the issue of, there are two things, right? There's a the treatment effect. It's called U equals U. If you're undetectable, that means you're on the medications and your virus is no longer detectable, right? That's, mm -hmm. So if you're, it's called undetectable equals untransmissible. So if you're taking your medications and your virus is undetectable, like it is with Magic Johnson, he's had an undetectable viral load for 30 years. We now, in the 90s, we, we began to think, oh, those people won't infect others. But we didn't know it. It's been really about a decade that we've known it for sure, 
And in that decade, it's become public policy, right? In the public. So now everyone says, don't worry about it. You know, you have to protect yourself from other stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's a lot of stuff, out, stuff there. out there, <laughs> including, including. I don't know if you've heard about this, but this whole monkeypox thing. I don't know Wait. if you've heard about this in the last oh, few days. Oh no, I haven't, dude. <laughs> Let's get into this. What are the monkeypox? <laughs> um, you know, it's it's it could be serious. So there's a, uh, you know, monkeypox is a is a it's distantly related to smallpox. I, I'm not an infectious disease doctor, but. It, it gets transmitted from animals to people. It, it can it can be fatal, but it's now being now there's an epidemic of this in, in Europe, and now there's been cases of it in, in the United States um, where it's being passed around uh, sexually. So I didn't want to go into the monkeypox thing, but I, it's been in the headlines for a couple of days. But it but it's yeah. So if you're sexually active. You got to worry about other stuff now. HIV is manageable, but there's a syphilis epidemic, and um, you know, and there's always hepatitis C. So people need to be careful. But but HIV, we've got it under control. If okay, people hold know on. how to access therapy. Yeah. Okay, that's I'm I'm I don't know anything about monkeypox. So can you? <laughs> well, can well you I don't kind of, Oh, so it's <laughs> it's it's like a derivative of smallpox, and so well, I mean. I mean, what are what are some of the symptoms? Like, uh, that's kind of what I'm curious about. Well, I Do mean, you know? I only brought it up because it's been in the news for the last couple of days that I've been following um, as a as a doctor, and um, you're probably going to hear about it. Uh, it's far related. It's not smallpox. All right, okay. it's it's, in a, it's vaguely in the same family, so it's mm-hmm. nothing like that. Um, and it's and it, and it, it is in African. Uh, it is in African populations, and it's a bit of a problem, mainly people working with animals. But yeah, you can get it. You, most people just get these bad rashes, mm-hmm. um, and then you can get treated for it. But other people, um, you know, it, it can in certain people um, be quite serious. And so there's the CDC has basically been making, you know, is beginning to sort of start watching what's happening, and will probably begin to, you know, warn people about this. But the reason I bring it up is because it's mainly now in gay men being transmitted sexually, but it, it could go beyond that. Well, well, time will tell. Okay. So I shouldn't have brought it up because I didn't do my homework on it. Oh, no No worries. No worries. Uh, uh, John, you you kind of look into that and let us know. He's going to, he's going to get up. Yeah, no, 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 no worries. This is, uh, this is, you're, you're fine, man. You're fine. Uh, yep. that, that is why I did know about the, uh, the syphilis, right? It's it, and, and then the resurgence of that is because of the abuse of antibiotics, right? When I say abuse, that's probably the wrong word, but people will not finish taking an antibiotic, like what, let's say doxycycline. They won't, they won't complete it. And then the, vi- there's maybe some viral load left and then it mutates or it is right. able to get resistance to it. And and then yeah. uh, the antibiotics that we have are no longer or, or rendered ineffective. Correct. Like that's kind of what's going on with the syphilis thing at the moment. That is, um, that, that's a, that's a common problem with lots of infections, less mm-hmm. so with syphilis. To be honest, the big problem with syphilis is that, once it became clear that we don't have to worry, we can use, we don't need condoms to protect people from HIV. Less condom use has led to uh, basically these, these outbreaks of syphilis in many urban settings. Wow. You know, one thing that fascinates me about all these, these uh, viruses and diseases, um, I just I wonder where they come from. I, it, I, it, it's just like, you know, like has herpes been around since time and memoriam has, has uh, gonorrhea and all these other ST STIs. Have they been around like since the beginning of time or like who was a patient zero for herpes? Like what? Like I've always wondered that. I, that's, that's an interesting. So there are people who study that. Yeah. Um, patient zero. It's always been fascinating stories. Right, there's a lot of interest in right now in who was patient zero for COVID in Wuhan, yeah. right? Um, and huge debates as to whether it was in, you know, in the market versus in the uh, virology lab, um, and um, but uh, and for HIV, 
right? We thought that patient zero was initially thought to be a flight attendant that was flying back and forth from the East Coast to the West Coast and having mm-hmm. sex everywhere back in the late 70s. Oh. Um, and he became infamous as patient zero for HIV. It was nonsense. Uh, HIV got into people periodically in in the Congo region, periodically from monkeys to people um, over over the past hundred years. And what happened is in the 50s and 60s when they started building roads throughout the continent of Africa, truckers were now trucking into the Congo and then going out toward Lake Victoria and back and forth. And one transmission led to one group of individuals who were now traveling cross countries, getting on airplanes. And that's how this whole HIV thing took off. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know anything about herpes. Syphilis is supposed to come from certain types of animals. Don't know how that transmitted. Um, so, I mean, are we ta- like are people fucking these animals? Is this generally how this is being like bestiality? Is that what we're talking? No. I mean, okay, no, okay. Maybe, 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 that was the that's what I was told about sheep. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, like for syphilis, for syphilis. <laughs> okay, yeah. That that, that 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 may be. Um, my God, I am way out outside of my area of expertise. That <laughs> may good. be uh, urban legend. But it no, HIV be. was no HIV was was meat markets oh. handling monkeys for their meat and yeah. um and that's how those transmissions occurred okay wow one one thing i wanted to, to ask you now i have an expert on babies born with hiv um that are uh-huh. hiv positive is the the i remember reading somewhere a long time ago that you could, your body could develop immunity and it it could go away because the infant version of the virus, if you get it when you're a child is different. Is there any truth to that or am I making shit up? Yeah, I think, um, I think you're a little bit out there on that one. Um, okay. HIV and babies can be really bad. Most babies die very quickly. Um, and of the babies who survive and become children with HIV, then the immune system typically becomes takes over and becomes more effective. And so Mm -hmm. children can control their virus. They don't get sick as much, but eventually by the time they're adolescents, it catches up with them. Um, Okay. But yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't, uh, I don't know. But We don't see, we don't, you know, if you're pregnant, so we test pregnant women pretty, pretty aggressively in this country and it's very rare. For, uh, for there to be an HIV-infected baby in this country. Because we just give moms antiretroviral drugs and, and the babies are fine. Okay, okay. And then um, we were – there. I was reading something. Uh, this is kind of what led to the conversation is, is uh, this interview. Is there is a woman, I think, that is that was cured by HIV uh, or cured from – cured of HIV – and she, it, right. it had to do with stem cells. Could you do you can you elaborate on that? Or maybe I read that wrong. Yeah. So there are three people now, probably four, um, including this woman. The, the woman was the last one. I could tell you her story, but let me go back to the beginning. Okay. So there was a guy named Timothy Brown, used to be my patient, lovely man. He, he passed away from cancer, unfortunately, but. Um, Back, I don't know, 15 years ago now, when he was in Berlin, a doctor there uh, did a um, bone marrow transplant. Timothy had cancer and needed a bone marrow transplant for his cancer. Turns out that one in a hundred people have were born so that, such that HIV can infect them. Mm-hmm. We knew this back in the 80s in San Francisco. There are people who just had just endless amount of high-risk sex and never got infected. So we know who those people are. One in a hundred people have a genetic mutation such that their body doesn't become infected with HIV. And so what happened is that they took cells from one of those people and did a bone marrow transplant to treat the cancer and the HIV went away. That was Timothy Brown, the Berlin patient. Okay. And then it happened again several years with the London patient. 
And now most recently, it's a woman in New York who had a similar approach and she was cured. But the, the difference was in this last case, the, 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 the transplant was, was more modern and less and much better tolerated. She didn't get sick. Timothy and Timothy Brown was in the hospital for two years because of his transplant. He was really Whoa. sick. So, yeah, so there's, yeah, so there are three, now maybe four cases of people who have been cured by these bone marrow transplants from these people who can't get HIV. And how, um, I have so many questions. I'm trying to think of a good way to ask this. How is it like a, so the person that's donating, I, again, I'm coming into this world, not knowing much, right? Um, how much bone marrow are we talking about? Like transplanting, right? Like, as I'm just trying to figure <laughs> yeah. out a way, is there a way, is this like an entire person's bone marrow that we're just swapping no. out? I have no idea. <laughs> nope. Okay. Yeah, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't even say. We don't even do. It's not even bone marrow. So the bone okay. marrow stuff in your bone. That's where you get your stem cells, right? These yeah. cells that make all your blood stuff. Yeah. So we actually we can just get it from the blood, actually. So you. T so I do a big blood draw from you. So let's say you have that mutation and you're you're immune to HIV. So I I would you have stem cells in your blood. We would just take them out of your blood. We would process them, and then we would infuse it into the second person. And they would be cured. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but that's essentially what's happening. Yeah, layman terms, that's good. So that's, that's yeah. essentially. So, so is this something that can be replicated on a large, on a mass scale? Absolutely not. Why? So the 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 nuance that I did not mention, oh. right? The fine print. Okay. Is that let's say I have the the the, the magic stem cells, and you mm -hmm. have, and you want to be cured. You have HIV. Okay. Damn it. So for me to give you my stem cells, I would first have to get rid of all your blood stem cells. So I would have to give you massive amount of chemotherapy to kill all your the cells that you have right now. Okay, gotcha. And and that would be that's no fun. You can die from yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna lose your hair. You're gonna be sick. Oh, yeah, you're, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. You're, it's you're, cancer you're, therapy. You only do yeah. that for cancer patients. Yeah. So this okay. is, but, but, all right. So now let's, well, how, why do we care then if it's only going to be done in people with cancer? Because, all right, now, now we're 10 years let, let down. Now we're looking 10 years in the future. Okay. Okay. So the magic stem cells are not infected by HIV because they, don't have something called CCR5. CCR5 is the door by which HIV gets into the body. Okay. In 10 years' time, we, th we hope, I will be able to come up to you and say, listen, you have HIV. I'm going to give you an injection in the arm. In that injection are these viruses that carry a molecular scissors that will cut up CCR5 in your body. So I in give you an injection. Yep. Viruses go throughout your body. They get into the cells. They get into your DNA. They kill this. They, they knock out the CCR5, making those cells no longer infectable. You well, yes, I, I, I think I do. I'm going to have to repeat that back to you. So you walk up, you inject someone... <clears throat> With a virus that essentially switches off the CCR5, right? So it's no longer able to get infected, correct? Yep. Yep. How would – my mind's kind of blown right now. What are we doing with – are we studying – are we trying to – yeah, dude, you've, you think you might have broke my brain right now. Um <laughs> So there's obviously some sort of um, vir like virus research we're doing. So like there, I mean, this is we've essentially used the weaponization of viruses to our benefit. Uh, how? Uh, what other examples of medicine um, are there like this? 
This is a totally. Are we on the like cutting edge of medical technology, is, or am I yeah. just haven't been paying paying attention? Because I don't freaking know how this passed passed my radar, man. I'm I'm getting pretty bumped up right now. I'll tell you. I'll tell you where the great success has been. So this is called, this is gene therapy. You've heard about gene therapy, right? Yes, I've heard of gene therapy. Like um, I'm thinking of like CRISPR and things like that. Or make kind of yeah. on the same. So, okay. so when I said, yeah, when I said the molecular scissors, right? So the virus mm-hmm. gets in your body. It's what it does is deliver CRISPR throughout your body, and the CRISPR gets into your cells and cuts the C05. So it's it's the same thing. Yeah. So this is this is a. You know where it's you know where the greatest success right now in gene therapy is sickle cell. Okay. You should have okay. someone on your show about sickle cell. Sickle cell is um a terrible disease, primarily in Africans, African Americans. Mm-hmm. It's it's been completely it's been largely ignored by medicine. Young young babies get it, they can have terrible, painful deaths. It's a, just a dreadful disease. It's been ignored. Yep. Um for lots of reasons. And I'm sure you can figure them out. Yeah, yeah, I got, it. <laughs> I got it. All right. So you know where I'm going, but but it turns out that that it has become very attractive to people doing gene therapy because we can use this approach I just described to fix the sickle cell problem much easier than the HIV problem. Mm-hmm. And I believe there's been 50 kids now cured of sickle cell with these approaches. And and it's really, I think, just some of the best stuff going on in medicine right now. Oh, that is crazy. So you can use this to turn CCR5, a certain, uh, that gene off. Can you right. use this to turn genes on? Well, that's what you do in sickle cell. Yeah, okay. In sickle cell, what you do is you turn on genes that make better blood cells. Okay. Right. So, so you can do all this kind of stuff. Yes. It's, it's the wild, wild west. Yeah. So what, I mean, now I'm just like, my, you broke my brain for a hot second. And now I'm thinking of ways that like, how else, what are some of like, just generally speaking, what are other, what are some other broad implications for this, this new technology? Uh, well, it's we're, this is where things um, get weird on the Rick's Mind podcast. So don't be afraid. We're just kind of we, we, yeah, this yeah. is this is yeah. interesting stuff. All right. So I, some of the some of the biggest areas of gene therapy right now. Well, it depends on how you define it. Um, to be honest, the, the 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 biggest area right now is is in is in cancer, mm-hmm. where where we're taking out. So what I the, what I was describing to you was um, kind of like the future where we're going to be able to do this in anyone with a shot in the arm. It's yep, cheap. Yep. See, right now in cancer, we're using similar approaches. It's much more complicated right now. What you do is you um, for cancer, you take out your you get hooked up to a machine. You take out a lot of blood, put most of it back in. But then you take what's left over, and in the laboratory, you insert genes into those cells. And then you put those cells back into the person, and now those cells be, are, are cancer killers. They, they, they are programmed to run around the body and find the cancer cells and kill them directly. We're, we're doing that all the time now for leukemia and lymphoma. Oh, man. This is what, but that's not widely. Are we, are the, is this being done in like a clinical trials where it's a very small population of human beings that are like, Hey man, we got this. You're, you're dead without it. Is that kind of how it's, it's going down or, or, or. Well, yeah. So again, the, the, I, I didn't give you the footnotes, the nuances. Yeah. yeah we like this half a million, So for right now, these cells, these therapies cost half a million dollars. <sighs> So they're not widely available. No, no. But they are available. But a lot of but but a lot of people are getting them through um, clinical research studies. Okay, okay. Then that's yeah, but only but it's unfortunately right now it only works for leukemias and lymphomas. It doesn't work for like lung cancer mm. or liver cancer. You know, oh, wow. So, but we're working on that. But yeah, it's there's like a 500 different gene therapy indications being pursued worldwide right now 
for all sorts of stuff. But the big advances have been in, in cancer and, and sickle One cell. Se- wow. That's fascinating. I did not know a lot of this. So have we, have we essentially given up on that's okay. This also might be, I may be talking on my ass here, but I, I remember that we thought that nanobots were going to be the future, right? We were going to be able to send this. We're essentially just, um, I mean, I mean, I guess that theory got taken away and now we're, we're using viruses to like uh, program uh, viruses. Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right. So right now we're using viruses, Mm -hmm. but, but just because they're easy to find and we know how to work with them, but the future are these nanoparticles you're talking about. Okay. So that is still a thing. Like how far, how far is that down the pipe? How far is that down the pipe? Well, this is like monkeypox now. We're a little bit outside of my area of expertise. I'm not a gene therapy expert. I'm an HIV expert. Um, but um, the nano, so a lot of companies are shifting from these viral particles because they're somewhat toxic to these nanoparticles and um, and these and these. Um, there's actually kind of kind of similar to what we do. So did you guys? Well, you don't need to tell me this, but the COVID vaccines, right? The RNA vaccines. Yeah, yeah, MNR, M, M, N, R, N, A, right? Yeah, M, R, N, A. Those, those, are, those are kind of in the. They're kind of similar. They're, they're basically taking pieces of our RNA or DNA, whatever, and they're putting them into these nanoparticle type things. These, these, these particles that are made of fat, a little bit of. They're like fat little globules. Mm-hmm. And you inject them in the arm, and then they go into your cells. That, that's the delivery mechanisms are go- are shifting from these viral vectors to what what was used in these um in the covid vaccines. Yeah, man. So we just need to start doing it for all gene therapy. This is crazy. What I feel like I don't know, I may maybe I'm super late to the party, but I feel like there's this just a a, a new frontier in medical uh, treatment that is 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 opening up right now. I mean, we've we've been waiting for the the, the nanobots, um, I think I think you said nanoparticles, but we're waiting for those to come down the pipe. We, we now we're using you know, viruses. Like, like I got to ask you, this is a super broad question. Um, what else? What else do I not know about now, man? I do not live in this world every day. I'm kind of just a. I'm a. I'm kind of a bro. I like to lift weights. I'm pretty on the cutting edge of. But what, the, dude? What else is going on out there, Doctor Stephen Deeks? What? Tell the good people. What? What other magical things are they working on in these labs, man? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Um, huh. That's a broad question. So it's, what excites it's super me? Bro- it's, yeah, yes. Yeah. What excites you? That's a better way to do it. Well, what excites me is um, is that the, 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 the science is amazing. Um, and, and HIV, to be honest, that those HIV stories I told you are some of the best examples of how science can fix things. Um, and I'm a big fan, of course, of COVID vaccines and treatment. The big problem, Rick, has been has been implementation. Yes. All right. Not quite as exciting as talking about gene therapy, but implementation. So the the problem that we face has always been that we do these great things, but no one can access them. Um, and so. Everyone is, everyone is, we're, we, we live in a new era where you, you can't do anything in science without recognizing the fact that what you have, what you do can't just make a lot of money for a company and being given to rich people in urban settings it has to be, av- it has to be scalable, it has to be made available to everybody. Um, and not everybody wants this stuff. Gene therapy sounds kind of scary, um, mm-hmm. I think. I think some of your listeners are going, I don't want that stuff. I don't want someone crazy Dr. Deeks giving me an injection and m- messing around with my DNA, you nuts. So what we're doing that that is really important is we're, we're really trying to get into the communities in need with community people that live in those communities 
and find out what people want and what they don't want, and then trying to build things that people are going to use. That's a whole, that was never part of what we did in science, but that is now central to everything. So I'm involved in all these efforts of trying to come up with, with, with ways to sort of prepare communities for these great big advances so that people, you know, have the education and, and know and can make their own decisions as whether or not it will work for them. We learned this with the COVID vaccines. I think that's very, very fair, right? Like people need like that, that, that what you just said, right? Like people need to make their own decisions. Right. And I think, I also do think, you know, gene therapy, it did sound scary. Case in point, the power of J and J flows through me. I was like, I don't know about that, man. I'm going to be a, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and if I'm being fair, I probably, if it wasn't for my girlfriend and her persistence, I was one of the guys who was like, I'm going I'm to, like, I, for example, I would tell everyone, I'm going to wait till they have enough shots. The government, and then, then that quickly turned into the government will contact me when they, when they have enough shots I want to go after. And then, you know, my girl came over and we had a bit of a fight and I was like, listen, I, I've, I've, I'm not that I can't be, af- I'm not afraid of a needle. I've taken illicit drugs. That's definitely probably way more dangerous than like a needle in my arm. If it makes you happy, fuck it, I'll do it. And and then I got J and J, but that was a little bit of my protest was like, I'm not doing two shots. I'm just going to do one. And, um, I mean, I guess it kind of worked. I still got COVID, but I didn't, you know, I didn't get to the hospital or anything like that. But um, I think that, I don't, I don't know, as a doctor, where, where are your, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that? Like, I think, I think your, your response is spot on, right? I mean, we were operation warp speed. Remember yeah. that? Oh yeah. Who wants to take a, who wants to take a, a drug that was developed at warp speed, right? It was terrible messaging. Yeah. Um, and then you come out with RNA and everyone's going excited about all this new tank. And it all sounds very, who wants to, who wants to be manipulating their own DNA? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I get it. You're, and then you're young, you're healthy. Your chance of dying from COVID was pretty low. Yes. Oh, so, yeah. so your response was, was, was totally understandable. I, I, I would have, if, if, if I was your doctor, I would have twisted your arm just like your girlfriend for a lot of reasons. She's in the medical Maybe, industry. <laughs> yeah, you know, so these vaccines, they, I mean, do you have, do you, your parents, are they still around? Are they healthy? They're still around, and that was a big, and they're all, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're old. They're old. Yeah, um, so you had to get the vaccine so that if you got the virus, you wouldn't, tra- you'd be less likely yes. to transmit it to them and keep them healthy. So that's, that's why you should have done it, and I'm sure that's why your girlfriend yeah. slapped you around. They lived in Tennessee, so I there was also like they, I li- I'm, I'm here here on the West Coast. My parents live in Tennessee, so that's I was like I'm not around any old people, like I'm fine. But yes, that's I mean it's a I think that's fair. I think that I think it's fair. I also but I also feel like you shouldn't be demonized or like hated if you didn't get the vaccine, right? I I don't know. I, totally we spe- we we spread too much hate during that. Like it, everyone wants to. F- freaking form teams man and like that's never a way to get things done you kind of got to let people have their own autonomy over what they want to do yeah i i I will i'll give you the other side of the story though yeah was the doctors and nurses in the hospitals were overwhelmed during delta by unvaccinated and it was just that would be hard that was hard yeah so everyone everyone was upset no one handled it right but that's my point. We didn't. Operation Warp Speed was all about developing the, the sexy new thing, and nothing was done to prepare people to figure out what people want and what they'll take and how the message is stuff. And that yeah. that was a major major mistake. And then everything got everyone got you know, all got politicized, and then there was team, uh, your team and my team. Yeah, and, oh dude. god, it was dreadful. So a lot yeah. of mistakes were made. Lots of mistakes. I do want to talk to you now now we're on COVID, right? Um, You're a long COVID specialist. This is my own personal experience. I did get COVID. It wasn't that bad. Um, But I will say, dude, I had a cough that lingered for John. I mean, we were doing the podcast and I have coughing it for 
Probably a solid at least three or four weeks. Yeah, like three or four weeks after co- I felt a hundred percent is able to run, work out, was testing negative. But dude, this cough would not go away, and I was like, man, I, I might have a bit of that long COVID. So, and I've also seen not documentaries, but just I don't know, various things on social media, and and, and um, so I had some friends right that you know, some of them are going on a six, seven months without having their sense of smell back. Others, some, I mean, I think there was a, a case in, I want to say somewhere, I want to say in, in Europe where someone like had trouble walking after like, what, what, what is going on with long COVID man? <laughs> All right. So in, in April of 2020, we had this, we had a big massive HIV program that we had to shut down. Um, and so we, but we had this capacity to study people with viruses. So we, we built a COVID program mm-hmm. um, and, and very quickly, you know, so COVID hit the United States in, um, in February, March, 2020, we had this program in April, 2020. And in May, 2020 on social media, there have been all these reports of people who survived COVID, but just weren't getting better. Now, some people had a cough, but I, I don't know if anyone, that's not really long COVID. I'll tell you what that might've been. Um, some people lost their smell, but the real, the real problem were the people who were basically like you running, going to the gym, who then became basically bed bound and can't get out of the house. That happens maybe one or 2% of people or get knocked out by COVID to the point where they're basically disabled. They have severe fatigue and they can't exercise and they have chronic diarrhea and chronic pain, all sorts of stuff. That is infrequent. Happens more in women than men. Um, but it's, but one or so since, you know, basically everybody's going to get COVID. So one or 2% of our population, that's millions of people are going to be suffering from this. It's a big, big deal. Now, yeah, you don't, I don't know, know anyone like that, it sounds like, so that's good. No, but I just, I didn't really think about, I, I'm, I'm glad you did say that. Like, we're all fucked, but we, everyone's going to get COVID. Like, right? Like, everyone's going to get it, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that's that's what I remember in the beginning was, they're like, we're going to just try and slow the spread, but everyone's going to get this. So then I feel like the, the messaging kind of changed. Like it's like, everyone's going to get it. Um, but what you're but saying here's the most scares important the thing. shit the most out of me. Thing. Yeah. yeah. The most important thing I have to say, if you have, if you're vaccinated and you get COVID, all the data suggests that your risk of long COVID goes way down. Okay. So I get my boosters. The minute my boosters are approved for my age group, I'm literally first in line. Not because I'm worried about getting hospitalized or dying, mm-hmm. because I don't want any risk of long COVID. Oh, um, you Dr. Deeks, you son of a bitch, you're freaking me out right now because uh, we'll I have COVID not. Uh, I know I got the, I got it. I got it. I got it. But uh, what? <laughs> Let's, 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 let's talk about these boosters, man. Uh, that has not happened yet. Your boy has not got one. I figured that the almighty J&J would be, I'd be good for, let's, I thought it was like a tetanus shot, man. Look what's going on here. So, yeah, so J&J has gotten a, J&J has gotten a bad rep. Um, that's the one that causes clots, primarily in young women. You're not a young woman, so you were probably okay. All right, cool, cool. But, but we don't we don't really give it as much. But it turns out that the immune response to JJ is maybe not as powerful, but it's it's more durable. Oh, nice. So it's, so it's not a bad, but you still need, it still desperately needs to be boosted. But time out. I did also get COVID, so like I now have the antibodies. Throat from the, right. the powerful J and J and the COVID immunity. Yeah. So shouldn't when I did you get be COVID? F- you're probably you're probably you're you're when did you get the COVID? Oh, uh, it's a good question. I'm gonna say like maybe three months ago. All right, yeah, you're pretty good right now. 
Ooh, let's uh, go. But 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 you're probably in a month or so, it's going to be time to get the vet booster because the COVID <laughs> for, COVID doesn't protect against Omicron. It's weird. We don't know why. I'm pretty sure I got COVID, Omicron. You did get Omicron. Um, if it was three months ago, okay, but, the, okay. but the Omicron infections don't protect it. So people get Omicron over and over and over. Uh-oh. So I'm going to talk to your girlfriend and if she's still in the picture and have her get you a, a boost because you with an RNA vaccine. So either Moderna or Pfizer, you should boost. Yeah, don't worry. You'll have a producer doing that as well. <laughs> so uh, so with, the, with the, the gene therapy, now I understand how this works now, so I'm not super, super scared. I guess I'll go with the, what, what about the Russian one? Is that I heard the Russian vaccine was pretty good. What's the what was the name of that one? Uh, Sputnik, right? Is that Sputnik? Sp- dude, yeah. It's, I Sputnik. think it's a, it's, a, it's yeah. It's either the it's either the, I think it's similar J and J or AstraZeneca. It's not the RNA. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's Sp- Sputnik Sputnik Five or Sputnik V. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sputnik V. Can I get my hands on some of that Sputnik? You don't want that one. You you want <laughs> you want the good old Moderna or Pfizer. Moderna or Pfizer. All right, all right. F- Pfizer seems to be sponsoring everything, so I'll go to Moderna. I think I'm just I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll I, I'll I'm, I take I'm taking you seriously, man. I, I probably will get um, boosted. I mean, to be honest, I I think you my girlfriend's get she's getting it done, and so like I don't know. We'll see if we have to have a fist fight about that or not. But um, <clears throat> I'm good now, so I've got some time. Don't have to worry about it at the moment. Uh, are the other the other types of COVID um, the original one that the are they fading out? Or are they still infecting people? I don't even know, man. What's going on? I, 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 so I, that's, I, actually, that's I, I'm curious about that. Yeah. So the original it's called ancestral, right? The one that was from mm-hmm. Wuhan. Yeah. Then you had alpha, beta, delta, gamma, alpha, beta, delta, and omicron. Yeah. No, those old ones, delta, they're gone. I mean, they may be popping around very low levels, but Omicron is so much more infectious. Yeah. That that Delta just can't compete. And BA1, BA2. So now in South Africa, they have BA4 and 5. That's probably going to sh- start showing up. These things get more and more infectious. These are about the most infectious viruses we've ever seen. So they're just... They're just, they're white. They're just going straight through communities. Like in San Francisco right now, we're having a bad outbreak. So, but okay. At what point though, right? Do we just think that this is like cold? Like when, Um, when are we going to be to that level to where it's like, all right, like I got COVID, but I'm going to, I can, I'm going to your birthday party. I got the sniffles, got a little cough, no fever, but it's, you know, it's COVID dog. Like, that's just like, this is, you know, what, are we ever going to get to that point? No. Um, for young, healthy people, <laughs> if you're not worried about long COVID, sure. Cool. But immunocompromised people, people with cancer, older people. People who've had transplants, maybe some people with HIV, they're going to have to be more careful, which means their friends are going to have to be careful. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, the cold doesn't give people long COVID. The COVID gives you long COVID. So I, no one knows what the future is going to be. Um, you know, we can't live in masks and be hermetically sealed forever no we can't but this is not the common cold i don't think it ever will be so how society figures out this stuff i don't know yeah and that's <clears throat> that's it is it's a weird it's a it's, it's a very complex thing you know i i, I think obviously exercise, not being obese, um, getting sun. I don't know. I'm, I'm just probably sound like a broken record, but you know, vitamin D, all those things help, but you know, really just trying to strengthen your immune system, cold showers, sauna, all that stuff, right? Like that's, you, you got to take care of your body. Um, and those, that's kind of, you know, what I've 
try to do. I barely get sick, and and but you know you do need to be cognizant of others, and that's the that's the it's the tricky part. So it gets really that tricky. That is the tricky part, right? So, you, so, so it's not necessarily about protecting you. It's about protecting your mom and your dad and everyone else. And that's where things get very tricky. Yeah. So, you know, worrying, avoiding being overweight. If you have high blood pressure, keeping it under control. If you have diabetes, these all things protect you from COVID and long COVID, no question. But I'm still a fan of masks. Oh, really? I wear, my, I wear masks everywhere. Man, I wear my are, mask, and um, they don't bother me. What, what, I don't know why. It, it's, it's it, just, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me at all. But I mean, cloth masks don't fucking work. Uh, the little right, no. the little things that I have don't work. Um, no. I, I'm not. I'm not like a thousand. I think what this is, the M95 is the one mask that that works. Right, they're uncomfortable. Maybe. So the one that's sort of in between is called the KN95. It works yeah. pretty good. It's more comfortable. It's more attractive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of people like me, we wear KN95s, and I wear like an uh, you know the N95, right, right, mm-hmm. the, the Rolls Royce. Of, uh, I'll wear that on airplanes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, I just, I don't know. I, my thing is, I, I'm just, I don't watch the news. Um. It's too depressing, and I it's I don't know I I I just decided a while ago that I was like, I'm done with COVID like I don't want to hear about it anymore I just want to continue to go and that's I don't know man like I just think for my mental health and that it was just time to try and move on because like there's there's a certain thing that happens when you. Like we're all going to die. It's inevitable. But I feel like sure. the the American media is so hell bent on like fear mongering. Like I don't I don't think that one can necessarily control you, you obviously can wear a mask, wash your hands, all this stuff, but really, like really, there's never been an airborne pathogen that we've ever been able to, we can't cure the cold. Like, like we're all going to get this. Like it doesn't make sense to me, like to be, to be afraid of it. I mean, like there's so many, like life is so full of risks that like, I, I just don't have the mental energy anymore to be afraid of like getting sick. I've, I don't know. That's kind of, I have a different way of looking at things. I'm not trying to be offensive or anything, but it's like, it's not as we talked talked before. It's like I don't it, technically. I'm in a very low risk demographic of humans. Yes, and but I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's so complicated. I, 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 I what you just said is not complicated. I agree with everything you said. Okay, cool. But you have to make a decision on a few things. All right. Right. Do you ride a motorcycle? I don't know. Oh no, I would love to, but yeah, it's I got a mom. She, she's yeah, so, well, you know, riding a motorcycle is not good for your health, but people do it because it's part of who they are, and they wear a helmet. Hopefully, mm-hmm. I, I bike, I wear a helmet, I I wear my seatbelt. You know, it's like you have to make these decisions. You go through life, you know, you, you, you do things that are risky, but the big decision, to be honest, is to be vaccinated or not, to wear a mask or not. To do go indoor dining or not, you know, those are the kind of like the big decisions. Go to the gym or not for me. Those are mm-hmm. like my personal opinion. When there's a surge, like there is in San Francisco, I won't do indoor dining. I won't go to the gym. But when things are calm, calmer, I'll do that. But with a mask. Okay. On. Okay. All right. But here's I got one one bit of beef though. Like you you walk in, sit down at a restaurant, and then you take your mask off, and then you eat. Yes. Like, are you That's but risky. like, huh? It's super risky, risky. But like, why wear a mask at all? Like, if you're going to take it off while you're eating, like, it, like, is there an invisible barrier around the table that co- that keeps COVID away? It doesn't make sense to me. Well, it just makes me feel better, maybe. <laughs> You know, hey man, people. that's no, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I'm glad you admitted it. I love you for that. That is totally fair, dude. If that makes you feel better, and it's, I get it. 
it's your comfort comfort zone. I get it. I just totally. it's that's never made sense to me, but I get it. It's like even but, yeah. okay. A, another thing, if you go to the gym with your mask on and you right. sweat through it, it's pretty much fucking ineffective after that. Correct. Well, what the mask there is doing is it's preventing me from spreading droplets everywhere. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and so I, and so there I'm not infecting other people, but I don't want anyone near me in the gym spreading their droplets on me. So when I go to the gym, it's more about, is there ventilation? And, um, you know, are people wearing masks or not right now? People aren't wearing masks in the gym. So I'm like, I'm not a young, healthy man like you. I'm 60. So I'm staying out of the gym until this gets figured out. I think that's 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 fair. But are you doing more detriment to yourself by staying out of the no. gym? No, no, no. I'm no. I exercise every day. I'm I'm in San Francisco, and you know, I walk up hills every day. So that's what I do for my exercise. I'm trying to stay in shape, but um, but I stay out of the gym. I miss it though. I love the gym. Yeah. Do you have, have you ever been to the Hong Kong Lounge? <laughs> I'm sorry. Just I d- listen. That's the best dim sung I have ever had in my life. Are you a fan of dim sung? Yes. Where is it at? Downtown Chinatown? Uh, I have no idea. Just the Hong Kong Lounge, dog. Like you got to go there. It is absolutely incredible. Um, go ahead. What's up, John? Uh, it says that it's on uh, Geary Boulevard in San Francisco. Yeah, Geary's a main. Geary goes from one uh, side of San Francisco to the other, so it's yeah, probably it's, it's five three two two. So I'm not. I have, I'm not familiar with San Francisco. When this, when this, when does the surge doesn't have outdoor dining because I I'm only going if no, it has outdoor dude, dining. It does not have out. I I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Right. San Francisco. San Francisco is a great city. Well. Uh, I mean, is there any way people can get involved in the community uh, organizations that you're a member of as far as like getting the public equipped for what they will do? Like, can you tell, tell the listeners a little bit more about that? Uh, we have, um, we have um, in, in the HIV space, um, a bunch of initiatives to do this. Uh, it's being run through one of our NIH programs. People can Google my name um, and get my email and and reach out and we'll we'll connect. I'd be happy to do that because we, we need we need um, yeah frontline people. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. I really I really appreciate you coming on and sharing sharing a lot of this information with me you definitely educated me i feel definitely smarter for talking to you and if we have any uh you're you're now the, the medical correspondent for the rick's mind podcast <laughs> <laughs> i love it All yeah right. That's cool. I, All right. yeah i i i really i really i really really enjoy talking with you you got any social media anything you want to throw out there no. it's good I, for I you dude. i got 10 i got 10 followers on twitter so no i'm a but I, but I do old fashioned email. That's my, and people can find me. I'm easy uh, to get. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, be sure to subscribe on YouTube, folks. We got a clips channel. Subscribe right down there. Rick's Mind, Instagram, Twitter. And as always, thanks for listening, folks. We love you. We'll see you next week. Bye.